Shalom, everyone. Welcome again to our series on the book of Leviticus. Um, today, we have the savory subject of leprosy. Blotches on the skin. I see that in the, on your source page, page, there's an illustration at the beginning of blotches on the skin. Not very pretty. Um, what a subject. This is one of the forms of impurity. There are many kinds of impurity. There are those that are basically natural phenomena of the body, but somehow appearing in a pathological form. Um, or phenomena that have to do with bleeding, for instance, for a woman in, after childbirth, uh, a woman, a menstrual woman, and the sense in which that makes her impure in a, almost a technical sense. But when we come to Tzorat, that disease, that disorder, is one of the disorders, it's categorized um, by the rabbis as one of the disorders, hayotzot migufo, that originate inside the body, that it comes out of your body. It's an issue, it's a discharge of some kind. But this time, it's blotches, it's burn-like patches, all kinds of different ways it can look which have to be diagnosed by, not by a doctor, but by the priest, Hakohen. Uh, the references to the priest are close to a hundred, or close to a hundred references to the priest in his role in diagnosing and uh, prescribing for this problem of leprosy, which suggests right away that we're not speaking about a physical disorder, even though it manifests as a physical disorder, lesions on the skin somewhat repulsive. And then the question of diagnosis. And it's the Kohen who has to see, the priest who has to see, you, bring, you go to the priest and he looks, tremendous emphasis on the visual, he looks at it and he decides what is to be done. Either you are tahor, you are pure, or you're impure, or there is an in-between stage, a quarantine stage, uh, maybe in which case you are put into quarantine for a week, for seven days, and then examined again. It sounds a little like going to see an epidemiologist, going to see someone who is worried about diseases of infection, except that many of the laws that, that, that go, come around this disease have nothing, obviously, to do with infection. They have to do with something more psychic, something to do with with um, things that are hard to categorize physically. Last week, um, in fact, we, want, we can make a connection. Last week, we talked about anxiety. We talked about the, either the sudden attack of anxiety or the ongoing sensation and experience of anxiety, which is an internal um, sensation, it's an internal uh, disorder. Uh, if you remember, Nadav and Avihu, the two sons of Aaron, they are, uh, they are somehow pressured, internally pressured, according to the Rashbam, according to the reading that we were interested in. They were pressured by internal, some kind of internal tension into bringing a normal everyday sacrifice um, with using the blood from, I'm sorry, using the fire from their own ovens using the fire, domestic fire, rather than waiting for the fire to come down from heaven. Right? The anxiety level was too high with them. They couldn't wait any longer. Lo sharta shchina. That was the doleful theme that ran through the rabbinical comments on what on the surface looked like the happy eight day, eighth day in which God did bring his presence to dwell on the Mishkan. The rabbis read between the lines and they detect failure and disappointment and anxiety and shame at every stage until finally it happens. The fire does come forth from God, but it consumes those who hadn't been able to wait for it because their, their anxiety level was so high. We, we used uh, an expression uh, which I took from Christopher Bollas contemporary psychoanalyst, he talks about the problem of the normotic person, the person who can't, can't bear the unknown, can't bear the realm of I don't know, 
the realm of imagination, the realm of dreams, of hope, the ability to wait, to hold your position, and instead they rushed in and became all too practical. Uh, they wanted to be normal. And in the end, the fire came down and consumed them on its path to consuming the sacrifices. Now, that expression of anxiety ends in death. At the end last week, we looked at a very powerful midrash, which describes the anxiety of the reader of the story. Vayecherad libi, a quotation from Job, from the book of Job. Vayecherad libi, my heart shuddered, v'yitar mimkomo, and jumped out of its place. That quotation from Job apparently describes Job's reaction to a thunderstorm, a lightning storm, which shocks his whole system, throws him into some kind of existential anxiety. But the Midrash relates it to the anxiety of someone who's trying to understand the story of Nada van Vihu and can't find a way of classifying all the facts so as to explain what happens to these two young men in a way that is rational and that satisfies all the data. Right? Kind of scientific, solid, stable reading is impossible to find. When we have that experience about reality, about the reality we're in, our experience is then one of anxiety, angst. Um, and now we are moving into a very specific example now of the undiagnosable, right, the unclassifiable disease that, that is called tsoraat, which is sometimes translated leprosy, but is not identical with the, contempt, the, the disease we know. Uh, as leprosy. It has many anomalies in it, which really set it apart from any diagnosed and known disease. Even the fact that it can affect not only the skin of one's flesh or basaro, but also it can affect one's house, it can affect one's clothes. What disease is it that in a sense in a sense, is the common denominator among all these different theaters of action? one's body, one's clothes, one's, one's house. Unclassifiable data. Um, the South American, great South American writer Borges, B-O-R-G-E-S, has a wonderful essay uh, in which he refers to a Chinese encyclopedia, probably mythical, he probably is probably fiction, fictional, but he writes about it as if this is a fact. And he, and he, in which he will find a passage like this. He looks at its pages. It is written that animals are divided into, and then there are many, many categories. How would you divide animals? How do we divide animals? Look at how the ancient Chinese did. A, those that belong to the emperor. B, those that are embalmed. C, those that are trained. D, suckling pigs. E, mermaids, F, fabulous ones, and so on and so on. And when you read a list like this, you know, which is really so un unconnected, specific phenomena, you have a reaction, suggests uh, Michel, uh, Michel Foucault, um, the French philosopher. He, you have a reaction as if some, you, might, you might laugh, you might find it ridiculous to break reality up into these particular groups, because this way of, classic, of classifying things breaks up all ordered surfaces. And it's used to tame a wild profusion of existing things. Right? That's any method of classification is used to tame that wild profusion of data. But when you read a foreign classification, one that you're not used to, then the feeling is that you, the familiar landmarks of my thought have been shattered, he says. Uh, I'll quote another sentence. He talks about, Foucault talks about the exotic charm of another system of thought. The exotic charm of the exotic charm of reading a foreign system and being faced then with its foreignness and also with the limitations of one's own system. One suddenly feels, to quote him, the stark impossibility of thinking that, 
I couldn't possibly think in that way, in the way the Chinese encyclopedia uh, thinks. And that feeling of being suddenly flushed up against a foreign way of thinking, a foreign way of being rational, has complicated and interesting effects on one's normal way, one's normal rationality, the things, the things that, I, that I am used to. Um, Ramban, if you have a look at number one on your page, right, he is our starting point among the classic sources. Um, Ramban discusses the kind of leprosy, the kind of tsara'at, I think I'll avoid translating it, since it is somehow idiopathic, it's, there's, there's nothing like it in the, in the medical encyclopedias. The habeged, if it happens to a piece of clothing that it's afflict, afflicted by, by blotches of tsara'at, so Ramban starts off by saying, very absolutely, this is not to be found in nature at all. This is not a natural phenomenon. It's not a physical phenomenon. And it doesn't exist in the world outside Eretz Yisrael. It's specific. It's a disease that is physical. And yet it, oh, you only find it in Eretz Yisrael, in the land of Israel. And the same thing is true of the, 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 the tzorad that happens in houses. So houses and clothing. Right? It's only in Israel that these things ha come up. Why in Israel? It's nothing to do with the laws of agriculture here. It's to do with the notion that this is where the Spirit of God resides always. When we are whole to God, shleimim Lashem, if there is a certain wholeness in us, in us as a people in our land, then our clothes and our bodies and our houses are kept in perfect condition we have as a very high bar of, of physical perfection in us that is in some way the effect of that way of experiencing the presence of God and, be, and knowing God, being in a condition of knowing God. It has aesthetic, physical effects. But if someone actually does sin, and so suddenly it becomes a spiritual problem, then the sin manifests in an ugliness, kiur, that's the word for lesions here, an ugliness in his flesh or his clothes or his house, which acts as a sign, right? It's not exactly a symptom of a, of a disease. It's a sign of a spiritual disorder, that, a sign that God has turned away from this person, that a shadow has fallen upon the world, the world of this person who manifests in this way. And this phenomenon of psychosomatic disease, and Ramban doesn't, isn't more specific than that here, can be regarded and has been regarded by the sages, by the rabbis, as a kind of gift, a double-edged gift. Vinatati nege. I will give you this affliction of tsarata in your houses. What kind of gift is this? It's the gift which is a miracle it's a kind of negative miracle, but it is a kind of crossing of the lines between the physical and the spiritual, which doesn't usually happen. And it helps somewhere to tell the person who is afflicted, as well as all those around him, that he has wandered far from his wholeness, from his, his true north, his, his true direction. And that is a special gift that only happens to the Jewish people in their own land, to have this clear sign of disorder which is an invitation, to, an invitation for healing. Another point that the Ramban makes uh, very uh, forcefully is a couple of lines later, where he says, um, this disease only comes into play after the land has been conquered and divided up. Right? After the conquest and the division of the land, what happens at that point to the people, to the human beings who live in the land? When each person has achieved a certain equanimity, an intimacy with his own, his own envelope in the world, what belongs to him? He knows what piece of land is his, he knows what house is his, what clothes are his. He is well, in a way, he is well planted in the land. Only when that is the case, only then, nitya shvadatam, people, people's minds in some way are at peace 
And that is the time when they have the possibility of knowing God and God, God's presence dwelling among them. If there is a disorder now in that state, then that is a sign from God. And you're dealing now with a psychosomatic disease. Or Bussero. I want to focus really on, on that form of Tzarat. That is on the skin of his flesh. The skin. Or. Or is the envelope in which one's flesh is held. It's the liminal place between inside and outside. It's visible to the outside world. It manifests in physical form, but it's affected by and affects one's interior world as well. So it's a kind of in-between place which manifests internal dis-ease. As we know, the skin does very often send messages to the world about the moods we are in, anxiety or fear, right? Um, uh, one's, the, the condition of one's sin, skin, sweating, uh, and so forth. It's a giveaway. And in the same way, the other envelopes uh, of the body, uh, the, uh, the house and the clothes and so forth, the Ramban wants to see them all as indexes in a way, indexes to an internal state that is awry in some way. Another method of understanding, a way of understanding, an approach to the problem of Tzarat, I found in its much less well-known one, this is in the Hermek Davar, I didn't put this on your page, 19th century commentary. And he talks about when you come into the land of Canaan, when you come into the land of Canaan, then this disease becomes possible. It doesn't, isn't possible anywhere else. And uh, the Hermit of our office is a kind of geocultural spiritual diagnosis of the condition. The condition has to do with a state in which we are, as it were, we belong to the land of the Kana'anim. And Kana'anim, it, it, one of the references of Kana'anim is traders. Right? Now, one word for traders is Kana'anim, those who live on the long seaboard of Eretz Yisrael. Right, somewhere there's a very, we have, we have plenty of space for living at the edge of the country. And therefore, this is a maritime culture. It's a culture in which people go to sea and they meet other peoples. And what happens then is that you have a whole culture, not only of trade, but also of language. You have a kind of very lively verbal culture because you're always meeting different kinds of people. And that produces a different kind of culture and a different kind of, of human being. At its worst, you might say that it, it encourages a, cu a culture of gossip, of Lashon Hara. And that's how the Hamik Davar wants to bring up this classic diagnosis of Tzorat. That Tzorat is a symptom of evil speech, slander. And the Hermic Davar, in a modernistic sort of way, wants to give us a kind of materialistic explanation for that. Right? He wants to say that if you make your living you know, traveling and meeting people and trading, then the danger is, on the one hand, you will become very verbal um, for all kinds of reasons. And on the other hand, there may be part of your verbal culture will be putting down others. As soon as language gets very lively, somewhere there is then that lively, restless ten tendency in the exchange with others to be very critical and to put others down in order to put yourself up and so forth. So that maybe we have here now a kind of tension of values. On the one hand, in order for this problem, the spiritual problem to come up, one has in some way to be basically at home. One has to be makir kol echad ve'echad makir et shelo. Each person has his own safe place to be. On the other hand, it seems that culturally, there is a possibility of another value, which is the value not so much of stability, but of competitive economies. And that's what might uh, evoke, that, that's what might uh, raise in people the possibility of a misuse of language, of an abuse of language. With this, I want to go on to a fascinating midrash. You can see in number two, 
number two, v'zot tiye Torah ha-mitzorah. This shall be the law of the mitzorah. All right, that's the, the way the, the section is introduced uh, in Parshat Mitzorah. Um, the, the, the laws of leprosy cover most of uh, Parshat uh, Tazria, this week's Parsha, and a large part of next week's Parsha also. A great deal of detail, very hard to classify. And the Midrash then quotes another text, right? This is the way Midrash often begins, by quoting our text and then another proof text. Mi ha'ish hechafetz, mi ha'ish hechafetz chayim. Who is the person who desires life from the book of Psalms? And we all know that pasuk. We, 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 have, we have read it, we have sang it, we have sung it. Who is the man who desires life? And the answer is, of course, well, guard your tongue from speaking evil and seek peace and pursue it. We'll come, we'll come to that. But the Midrash now launches into its story. The story is now about a peddler, Rochel, who was moving around, circulating, constant movement around and around, among the villages. That's what a peddler does. The villages near Tsipori, which is the place of the rabbinical academy. And he was uh, announcing, proclaiming on his travels, whoever wants a potion of life, come and buy, come to me. Rabbi Yanai, one of the Chachamim, one of the sages, is sitting in his study, up in his, in his house, and he is sitting there and expounding Torah there in his, in his living room, in his home. And he hears the proclamation of the peddler. And he, uh, he calls the peddler and he says, come up here, I, 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 want, um, I want what you're offering. I want a potion of life. And the peddler, interestingly, Rochel, refuses. That is, he protests, he resists. He says, perhaps in a little embarrassment, he says, but what I have is not anything that you or anyone like you needs. You, you have no need of me. Presumably, the Rochel, the peddler in general, is, is selling sort of quack cures, quick, uh, a cure all potions, and he knows perhaps that he, you know, he's embarrassed that a scholar should think he has anything to gain by hearing from him what is this, uh, this potion of life, this, this vital, vital cure. So he resists, but Rabbi Yanai insists and says, no, 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 I, I want you to come up. So he came up and the peddler then, surprisingly, brought out the book of Psalms you know, he didn't actually hand over the potion. He just ha opened the book of Psalms. Who, who would have thought that a peddler, this is his territory? And he shows Rabbi Yenai this verse. Who is the man who desires life? And what is written afterwards? Netzor l'shoncha meira. Guard your tongue from evil. Sur meira v'asei tov. Turn away from evil and do good. Right? That's how the verse, is, that's how the, how the verse in, in Psalms continues. So there you have the question, is if that's what you want, then this is what you should do. Avoid evil. Avoid evil speech. So that is his potion. Rabbi Yanai then says, oh yes, and also King Solomon in the book of Proverbs, he also proclaimed saying, Shomer pivulu shono, shomer mitzarot nafsho. Right? And anyone who, who wants to, who is the... Um, Whoever guards his mouth and tongue guards his soul from troubles. So you see we have the same idea also, right, not only from David, but also from Shlomo. So Rabbi Yanai puts in his contribution here. But then Rabbi Yanai says to the peddler, who perhaps is feeling quite confounded that he's been teaching Torah to this great scholar, what has he got to learn from me? Rabbi Yanai then says, all my life, all my days, I've been reading this pasuk and I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know how to explain it. I was always blocked. It was a kind of crisis for me. Every time I read that pasuk, I felt blocked. And now this Rochel, this peddler, has come and let me really know it. He has made it possible for me to know what to do if you really want life. So suddenly I've really learned something from him. And because of that, Moshe also, Moshe, that's why Moshe originally 
uh, warned the people and said to them, this is the law of the Mitzora. And Mitzora is the word for the leper, the person who is afflicted in his skin. But it's read then by the rabbis, but with a play on words, Hamotzi Shem Ra. This is the law that affects those who bring out of their mouths words of evil, mutsi, who extract from themselves language of evil. So there you have the same truth hidden even in the Torah itself, that if you want life, then avoid evil speech. And of course, the question about this midrash, kind of nagging, anxious question, I think there's a kind of anxiety when one faces a midrash like this, is what does Rabbi Yanai, the great scholar, really have to learn from this peddler who hardly knows anything, but by some good fortune he knows apparently that verse in, in, in the book of Psalms. And of, there are a number of particularly modern commentaries who have very interesting suggestions about this in the direction that I'd like to follow. Uh, one is the Mea Shiloach, the Ishbitzer, um, <clears throat> who, I'll try to summarize what he says, and then also to move on from the Ishbitzer, from, from the Mea Shiloach, to his student, Rabbi Tzadok Cohen. What the Ishbitzer says is, this Rochel, this peddler, even in the, the word that's used to describe a peddler, tells you that this is a person who peddles gossip. That is, that is his occupational hazard. He is a rachil. A rochel is a rachil, rachilut, right? It's not just, it's not a pun, it's actually the same root. It means someone who wanders around meeting all kinds of people and trying to talk up his own wares, um, who has to be very persuasive. This is the kind of person who's going to trade in gossip as well as in potions. That's part of what a peddler does, to peddle. Right? He's going to peddle the news from the next town, and once he's peddling uh, gossip, then Lashon Hara, evil speech, is very close to the surface. And there comes a, p a point, and that's the, 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 what the Mea Shiloh has to, has, to, has, to, has to pin this down now, and he says what really is troubling a person who becomes a peddler and who spends his life gossiping and bad-mouthing other people is an internal problem, and he says it out of the blue, with kaas, with anger. Now, what has anger to do with it? But he's very definite about it. It has to do with anger. That he is somewhere, there's a kind of hidden, there's an unconscious, perhaps, anger burning within him, and he takes it out on the third person, people he talks about, perhaps in an attempt to make friends with the person that he's talking to. You know that, that dynamic. You think that if you tell, if A tells B uh, a negative, a bad story about C, then A and B form a, an, a, 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 a immediate kind of temporary alliance. Ah, you and I, we really are together. So I think the possibility that the Mea Shiloh is raising here is that our uh, peddler here is suffering from an anger that he somewhere feels that all is not right between him and people, that people will only listen to him if he badmouths other people. That's his own, only way of communicating, of being together with another person. So in a way, it's a kind of anti-sociality, anti-social habit he's developed because of some anger inside him. And then suddenly he realizes, the Be'er goes on to say rather uh, clearly, he says, well, and, and then this person begins to realize that it's counterproductive, and he does tshuva, you know, he works on himself so as to change. And it's once he has made that change, he's, he's somewhere healed himself, he has something to teach, some, even someone like Rabbi Yanai. What does he have to teach Rabbi Yanai, who is so different from him? Rabbi Tzadok Cohen, who uh, became uh, one of, one of the, the, the best students of the Mea Shiloach, radicalizes the Mea Shiloach's idea. He makes it even more radical. And he says, this Rochel, this peddler, this peddler is rakuv, 
Berchilut. Goes for, it's not just that he peddles gossip, but he is rotten to the core with gossip. That is, gossip has rotted him. Right, in some way, if you're talking about problems like tzara'at, you're talking about mildew, you're talking about something that is not alive, something, something toxic inside him. And in this situation, he has somehow come to realize how toxic his inner world has become and his way of behaving to other people or about other people. And he does tshuva. Right? He makes that move away from that, that problem. And then what he has to give to Rabbi Yanai, who apparently doesn't suffer from any such problem. He's a man who spends all his time learning and teaching Torah. What could be bad about that? And nevertheless, it seems that this peddler has something to communicate to the scholar from the earthiness and the pungency and in the words, I'm choosing words very carefully here, of his own experience. He knows what it's like to be an angry person and to be bad-mouthing people. And he knows how destructive it is. And he has made moves to make his life cleaner and clearer, part mostly out of a feeling that this is not good. And therefore, when he reads the Pasuk, who is the man who desires life, keep your tongue free of evil, and so on and so on, he reads it with a pungency of personal experience. You know, pungent is it's almost as if it has a, a, a smell about it, right? It has a particular flavor. It has a ta'am. That's the word, the word that Rabbi, Rabbi Sadok uses. The story for him, the pasuk now, that verse from Psalms, for him it now has a, a personal flavor of experience, of, of deep experience, deep and painful experience, somehow finding his way out of a kind of inner anger and inner anxiety in his, in his being and ending up somewhere with a different understanding of that verse. Now, it's that personal pungent experience of tshuva, of moving from one world to another that he gives to Rabbi Yanai, who always understood the meaning of the verse, but for the first time is really affected by the live experience of someone who has gone through it in a very personal and idiosyncratic way. I think Rabbi Sadok is also implying somewhere that what the Rochel is doing for Rabbi Yanai, what the peddler is doing for the scholar here, is making him aware of perhaps of unconscious anger inside himself. That maybe inside the scholar too, there can be, he may be nursing unawares, depths of, of negativity. And what these depths of negativity might be, well, the suggestion that I, I want to make is that it has something to do with the fact, a kind of occupational hazard of scholars. That in some way, the peddler and the scholar have something in common. Right? They are the same. They look very different. How could you possibly classify them together? And yet, if you look more closely, you can see that the good man and the bad man share something. What they share, apparently, is a kind of unconscious anger, perhaps not so unconscious in the peddler's, in the peddler's case. Um, and what the scholar needs to realize is that perhaps even the activity in which the, scho the scholar most, most powerfully manifests his talent and his wisdom, which is the activity of making distinctions, havdalot. That the job that the scholar has to do always is to make distinctions between things that may look very similar to see that this is not that. Yeah? This is yes and this is no. This is pure and this is impure. Right? These are the halachic decisions, the legal decisions that have to be made, discriminations. And it, in a way, one could come to a, to, a, to, a, to a moment of experience, if one is a scholar um, of this kind, in which negativity takes over one's whole, one's whole inner being. That is, one's always looking for what is not pure. One's always trying to distinguish between this and that, 
rather than, in a way, simply accepting everything, the whole issue of havdalah and of diagnosis and of making distinctions would be one in which uh, one is looking at two things that seem to be the same and are, in fact, very, very different. Have a look at the, uh, the, the source in number three now. Gemara um, Menachot, talking about a paradoxical situation. There are times, says Rish Lakish, sometimes right, your English translation softens it. In the Hebrew, it simply says, there are times that bitulash of Torah, the dereliction, the annulment of the Torah, really undermining the Torah, can in fact be its confirmation, its foundation. That is, the destruction can actually sometimes be affirmation. Uh, where do we get this idea, this very paradoxical idea from? Uh, the quotation is here from the book of Exodus, where God says to Moshe about the fact that Moshe broke the tablets. Moshe indulged in that very destructive act of destroying the Torah, the written Torah, the Ten Commandments, in rage, in anger at the people's making of the golden calf. So we come back then now to the issue of the calf. Moshe's reaction at that time, was that a deplorable reaction, that he smashed what had been whole into smithereens? And the uh, Rabbi Sadok likes quoting this Gemara, along with other pass rabbinical passages, to make this paradoxical point. There are times when what looks like destru a destructive movement can actually be something that takes you in through the direction of life, right? moves you from a kind of stalled place to a direction of life. Uh, quoting from this Gemara, Asher Shibarta, the tablets which you smashed, God says to Moshe in, in Exodus 34, read it as the rabbis do, Asher Yishar Kochacha, congratulations that you smash them. As if God is implicitly, when he simply refers to the smashing of the tablets, he's implicitly congratulating Moshe for this counter-intuitive act. Breaking can be a way of inducing a crisis, a crisis of anxiety, a crisis of uncertainty that allows something new to come to birth. Only once you have smashed those tablets can something else come to be. Ta unsmashed tablets are a little too like that normotic solution, right? That solution, kind of normal solution of holding on to the Torah, holding on to its stability and making sure that it will always exist by holding on to a thing, holding on to the tablets. That's dangerously close to a golden calf, to an idol. Instead, suddenly, there is destruction with its immediate vacuum, which invites a different way of putting things together. Uh, one, one movement that you find in the Gemara and in Rabbi Sadok um, very, very often, he likes, he likes to quote it, is, is the notion that, uh, for instance, someone doesn't get to stand firmly on words of Torah, one does, ein, ein om din al divrei Torah, one doesn't understand, really, the words of Torah, unless one has stumbled over them. It's a very similar kind of paradox. If you are just, you know, stolidly standing there, thinking you understand something, in a way the process, the live process of understanding is stalled. You're all too satisfied. But if you stumble, if you make a mistake, if you make an error, and you suddenly find yourself, you know, with one foot in the air and one foot out, out to the side, and suddenly there has been a, a loss of ground, you've lost that, that solid ground, that's when you begin to acquire the understanding of it. That's when you begin to be able to stand. Once you know what it is to stagger, then you can begin to stand in a more internally focused way. Uh, you really learn all the, 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 the Eastern martial arts, right? You learn a certain confidence in standing, which is not the confidence in the thing. Scholars have this tendency. Um, have a look at the next.
uh, the next source on your page. Um, right, they have the de the tendency. In fact, um, uh, you have a pasuk about lahavdil or lahorot. You know, Rashi in, on, on last week's parsha talks about how the the, the function uh, the function of the priests, who will become scholars later. Um, is to make distinctions and to instruct. And what we have here then is the Midrash number four, saying what is this to make distinctions? It's not enough simply to learn by heart and say it over and over again. You have to really know and discriminate and be, be expert in it. That is, you have to know all the possible nuances of difference that there are is between this and that, between kasher and treif. It's not a simple matter because there are many, many data that have to be taken into account. So your whole, your whole world will be one of discriminations, of looking for the negative as against the positive. These are the binaries. Ben hatame or ben hatahor, to make discriminations between the impure and the pure. Surely it could have just said, if you're looking for contrasts that it could have said you should be able to distinguish between a donkey and a cow. Uh, surely that would be a satisfying discrimination to make. But of course then the Midrash goes on and says no. Well, Rashi goes on here and says no, that's all too obvious. You know, that's, that's absolutely clear that there's a difference between a donkey and a cow. You don't need any skill at all for that. That's nothing to do with the priests. But it's a matter of being able to distinguish between what is impure for you and what is pure for you. Meaning, in the terms of the particular illness we're thinking of, the particular disorder, who you are, what time of year it is, the, the many, many fragments of the law that have to be somewhere pulled together in order then to arrive at a rational diagnosis in complexity. Right? It's not obvious, like a, like a donkey and a, 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 and a cow. And in that sense, then, what you are dealing with when you are, you are a scholar, when you are someone who is good at diagnosing, who is good at making meaning out of data, out of the blooming, buzzing confusion of things, is that you have, you have that capacity to think in the negative, to be aware of possibilities well, the basic possibility, of course, the basic truth that one has to be aware of if one's using language is that the word is not the same as the thing. Right? That the language is not the same as what it describes. And so there is that need to become aware of what it is not, what things are not. That exists only in the human mind, in rationality, in language. It doesn't exist in nature. In nature, uh, a table... Right? You can't say that a table, a table doesn't appear as something that's not something else. It is what it is. But when we talk about a table, we can say many things that a table is not. It's endless what we can say. In reality, there's only one stable thing it can be. But language opens up all these possibilities, including uh, toxic possibilities. Um, and so one of the complex possibilities that the... Uh, that, the, that, the, that Rashi deals with here is the difference between um, a case where, um, yes, an animal only half of whose windpipe has been cut through by the knife and another case where the greater part has been cut through. Right? In one case it's kasher, in the other case it's treif. So it's really very slight differences, but the slight differences are very important. And that's the way in which a talmid chacham, a chacham lives looking for these slight discriminations. Perhaps such a person could be nurturing in himself a certain unconscious anger, that is, a certain sense that the world is very much not what it should be. A certain sense of anxiety and bewilderment about the world and an attempt always to make sense, always to say, this is good and this is bad, this is pure and this is impure. Uh, because, after all, the world doesn't necessarily manifest with such clear meanings. Um, Torah Shabal Peh, Rabbi Tzadok Akon will like to say, the oral law is what takes over after you've smashed the written tablets. What takes over after that is a world of reconstruction of what has been lost, the using of the mind, 
the using of the mind to create, to reconstruct the reality, the, ab the direct reality, which is what Moshe gave the people. But immediately Moshe dies. We talked about this at the beginning of our series. Immediately Moshe dies, 300 laws are, for are forgotten, and there is a need for reconstruction. Memory, not as memory, but as interpretation. Lehotzi, again, this is a, uh, a text that Rabbi Sadok loves to quote. Lehotzi, one moment. Yes. Lehotzi yakar mizolel. Sorry, I had a blank there. To extract the precious stuff from the dross. That is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach to life. But the point here would be then that in extracting the good stuff, the gold from the dross, you can't do, make that movement of extracting, of articulating, of making something meaningful unless there is a mixture. And life presents itself as mixtures. And Tov and Ra, and Rabbi Tzedek Cohen likes to say, say this too, as do other Hasidic uh, masters, Tov and Ra, good and evil, are always mixed up together. So you can't make simple distinctions between a peddler and a scholar and say one is a righteous person and one is not, because in fact, each of them is some kind of a mixture. Maybe it's more crude in the case of the peddler and it's more refined in the case of, of the scholar, but he too has in himself Tov and Ra. And therefore, the verse in Psalms suddenly comes alive to him when he hears it, tastes it, through the flavor of the way the Rochel communicates it to him. It's a kind of eye-opener uh, for him. Now, in, in this case, uh, we move then to the Mer Shiloach, Number five on your page. On, on the issue then of who tends to be most prone to Surat, most prone to anger. And he comes up with a surprising conclusion that it's the greatest people who are most prone to anger. It's a paradoxical, again, it's a paradoxical attitude. It's a paradoxical way of presenting reality. Don't think you're going to find your tzaddikim pure, your righteous pure, and, or, or the opposite. Right? That your tzaddikim, the more righteous they are, the more prone they are going to be at a certain almost metaphysical anger. Um, what he says here, the word that introduces the laws of, of, of Tzorat, is Adam. Adam ki yeb or besaro, a person in whose flesh um, appears this uh, lesion. The word for is person here rather than ish. It's not, first of all, it's not gendered. Adam is a human being. A human being is then read, I think it's from Kabbalistic sources, as an elevated, an elevated, enlightened human being. Someone who is a real Adam, who deserves the name Adam. The really human, the truly human, he says, is above all kinds of worldly lusts. He doesn't live in the world of greed and lust, the kind of coarser world. All right? That's by the nature of his refinement, the, the, the person of, of high caliber, that's not his world. So he doesn't have ritzonot and cheshik for things that are not God's will. So somewhere he's in tune with God's will, with God's wish. But at the same time, this person is subject to anger, which manifests in surat. It precisely this person, because this attribute of anger is found mostly in great people because they don't have any pleasure of the goods in this world. They don't have any naicha. They don't have, they can't relax. They can't find relief in this world. There's something ungratifying for them about this world. Pleasure means nothing to them. And the good, the spiritual good that's prepared for them in the world to come, 
that is hidden from them in this world. So they live somewhere, somewhere between two worlds. They can't take the ordinary, honest, everyday pleasure that other people do in the world. They look for their pleasures elsewhere, and sometimes they're hard to find. And so they can be living a kind of a kind of world in a, in a in a reality somewhere uh, in which they begin to develop a kind of hostility in themselves to this world or the people of this world. Um, the only cure for this, he says, he calls it tovat ayin is deliberately to cultivate in oneself benevolent eyes, tovat ayin, a benevolent gaze, that is the opposite way of looking at other people, to look at other people with a kind of benign gaze, to train oneself to do that, rather than with the choleric, angry gaze of someone who is basically unsatisfied in this world. Um, the uh, the Mayor Shiloh points out elsewhere that the three greatest people of this period, Moshe, Aharon, and Miriam, all suffered from leprosy. Right? It is a kind of, it's an interesting um, observation. Right? Remember, Moshe's hand becomes leprous at the burning bush, and Miriam and Aharon also become leprous in, in the later story. That fits his thesis. That means these are the greatest, and they are people who are somewhere misaligned with the world. They live in a state of anxiety, anger, misfit in some way with the world. The world doesn't seem to be there. This world doesn't seem to be there for them. From this, I want to move on now to what happens to the person who has been diagnosed. He has been diagnosed, or at, at the least, sentenced to a kind of quarantine period. Right, the description in the Torah is very graphic and powerful. Um, it's chapter 13, verse 44. After he's been diagnosed, that's all kinds of details of the conditions that have to obtain. Then he is an ish tsarua. He is a leprous man, or as the Targum translates it, he is a set-apart man, sagir. He is a closed-up man. He becomes a human being who is closed away, who is isolated from society. That is now his fate. He is impure. Impure, the, the, the priest shall indeed impurify him. Notice how many times the word tame is used here. He is diagnosed by the priest as impure, impure. Not by a doctor. It's all in the power of the language of the priest. He diagnoses before he says those words, this man is not impure. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a linguistic category. It's a category that may have very little to do with the empirical reality of what people in general can see. And then this tsarua, this isolated man, this locked-in man, turns out to be locked out, in which there is this affliction. Um, his clothes should be tattered, should be in, ta in, in bits and pieces, should be fra in fragments. His head, his hair should run wild, parua. And upon his lip, he should, be, he should cover his lip with a kind of, perhaps with a hood. He should cover his head and, and his lips with, with, with some kind of clothing. He should veil his lips. So there he is, outside the camp. But first of all, we have a physical description of what, ha what, he, what is done to his body. His, he becomes completely unsocialized. He becomes a non-social person. Everything is wild now. It's as if his lips are sealed. Safam. There's only one joined lip there. He can't say anything. And the only thing he can do is to call out, Tame, Tame. Impure, impure. And suddenly you have the voice of this person who has sinned by misusing language in some way. And suddenly you hear that the only thing that will open his closed lips, the only thing he's capable of saying now, is the words, tame, tame. All the days that the affliction is upon him, right, the next verse, he shall indeed be impure. Again, repeating over and over again the word tame. 
בדד יישב מחוץ למחנה מושבו. He shall live, he shall, he shall dwell in loneliness. Lonely he shall stay outside the camp, shall be his staying place. That is, he is isolated from the camp, from all three rings of the camp. He died from the Kohen, Levi, and Israel. He's outside society, not even together with other impure people. There are other impure people who have to spend time outside the camp. But he is isolated even from them. Right? This is the quintessential isolation. Why? Badad Yeshev. Why? Have a look at number six. Badad Yeshev Michutz Lamachane. Who have deal ben ishli ishto, ben ishli re'ehu? He set up barriers by his malicious speech between husband and wife, between friends. Right? He was always slandering and creating boundaries, barriers between people. Therefore, the Torah says, let him live lonely outside the camp without the company of anyone else, even other impure people who would normally have each other's company. So you have again a kind of extreme, right? it's an extreme manifestation of a spiritual ill. This man has broken up society, has deprived people of the comfort and the vitality of being with those who they are close to. He has created animosities. And now he will taste what it's like to be totally isolated. Right? Here he is isolated, again, to an extreme. But what is it then to be Yoshev Badad? It's an unusual word, Badad. Of course, we remember the word Badad from Sefer Bigilat Echa. Echa Yashva Badad, right? the Book of Lamentations, which we say on Tisha B'Av. How does she sit lonely? Right? The people now, this people that were so full, you know, so, so populous, this city that was so populous, now it's com in complete isolation. What is the feeling about, what is, what is Badad? Badad, as it's used in the Torah, often has the meaning of solitary but secure somewhere, solitary but strong, right? a sense somewhere of security that no one, no one can attack her. Somewhere it has a kind of a positive, a, a positive implication sometimes, but with the idea of being a lone wolf, a lone wolf whose people are afraid of. However, there is this other, net, this other world of, of implications now, that we're talking, we're talking here about isolation and pain, painful isolation. So Rashi comments, for instance, on the word badad in the book of Echa, in the book of Lamentations. And he uses an interesting word. He says, galmud, he galmuda. That's a very unusual word. So he's, he's, he's explaining one word, but with an even more unusual word. Galmud means to be deprived, a menstruous woman, that means set apart, to be lonely, to be weaned of one's intimate relationship with the mother, yes, to be, to be separated from one's husband, to be abject, I'll use that modern term, to be abject, and to be shapeless, to be a lifeless lump, um, cut with the root of Galmud being golem, Gimel Lamed Mem, of course, the golem of Prague, we know it, it's someone who is without shape or form. Right? Here I am without meaning at all. Here I am incoherent, one mass of anxiety, you might say. Right? There's nothing that gives me a clear sense of who I am and what I belong to. Um, have a look now at number seven. This is the opening of the Midrash on Echa, number seven. Echa Yashvabadad. Shakadati v'ayye k'tsipor boded. Quotation now from the book of Psalms. I am wakeful, I am like a lone bird upon a roof. What an image. I am like a lone bird upon a roof. Now that is, that's it again, that's another proof text which has really nothing to do with Echa, where you find it. Right? Someone is comparing himself to, to, to a lone bird who is somehow wakeful. 
God said, Shakadati, I am wakeful to bring my presence to rest in the holy temple forever. That is, to be an eternal presence, right, that I will live there forever. But now I have become like a bird. Just as this bird, when her young are taken away from her, suddenly she's deprived of her young. They are weaned off her. They are, they are taken away from her. It's put impersonally. Someone has taken them away from her. He yoshevet badad. That's the word for it. She sits there, badad. What is badad? Kach anochi, so I, says God, have burned my house, I have destroyed my city, I have exiled my children among the idol worshippers, and here I am sitting here on my own. Now suddenly you have this poignant self-image of God. God who has destroyed, in a way, his own place in the world. Right? He's undone his own social place in the world. What he, what he is vigilant to that, this is what he really cares about, to be in his city, among his people, in the, in, the, in the holy temple. And now he's done it to himself. I have done these things. Right? It's not an impersonal thing, as the, as the Midrash interprets here. Right? The bird may, may feel it's been taken away from her, but God knows that, the, that God is the subject of desolation. God is the subject here of all the desolation of the world. It all comes to roost in the divine presence which has now ex been exiled from its, from its proper place. Ech yeshva badad. So that bird, who, that it is guilty, it's a kind of aggressor as well as a victim, gathers all the desolation of the world into, into its being. And that commentary on the book of Lamentations, I want to say, comes home to roost, right? It's drawn back into the original badad of the leper. Now, the leper too, right, he is the, he is the paradigm. He sits lonely, having destroyed himself, having destroyed his relations with others, having destroyed his relations, right? It, he, to, totally isolated, somewhere in a kind of, it's more than a poetic justice, it's a sense in a way of taking up an exiled and alienated place in a world that he has himself broken up. Right? He's, he's in a way living in the broken world that he himself has created. And to be mitzorat then, to be mitzora then, would mean in a word, to be in a state of suspended in animation. Yeah, I don't know what to do with myself now. There's a kind of stuckness. about. There he is outside the camp, and all he can do is cry out, Tame, Tame. What is he doing? How is it possible, perhaps, and this is my task from now on for the time we have, how is it possible to reach such stuck, anxious moments, in this case, self-destructive moments, as in a way, offering space into which one can go deeper and then perhaps create from that space a different kind of awareness of the connection with God, connection with others, coming from a place of desolation, not denying it and not ignoring it, trying not to think about it, but actually going deep into it. Right? to bring out something precious from, from, the, from the dross, from, from, from the dirt. Suddenly, this speechless man can say two words. Right? His mouth opens, becomes alive, and he says, impure, impure. Two possibilities. One is that he's warning everyone to keep away from him. Like the leper with his bell, Right? It's a mournful sound, impure, impure, keep away from me. You mustn't come anywhere near me. In which case, in a sense, he is now aware for the first time of the toxic effect that one can have on other people, and he's trying to protect society from him. He's warning, he's warning people about a health hazard. But more powerfully, the other possibility which you can see in number eight on your page, from the Gemara in Moed Katan. 
This is a benign possibility and it somehow emerges unexpectedly from this very glooming, gloomy setting. Number eight, tame tame yikra. He shall cry out, impure, impure. Melamed shetzarich lehodia tsaarof larabim. It teaches you that he should make his pain known to society, to many people. He should, his pain cries out, not his impurity. Cry, his impurity cries out, not keep away, but I am in pain. Why is that what, something he should do? Tzarich. Right? It's not self-indulgence. It's actually a commandment to make people aware of his pain. Verabim mevakshim alav rachamim. And then society, right, the plurality of people, many, many people, will ask for mercy for him. There's something about this, this Gemara that stirs me very deeply. It's a sense of crying out to connect with a world that really you have not had any place in up to now. All you've had to say is bad things about others. And suddenly you are appealing to the world, many people, not any particular person, but many people to do the thing that they will obviously do. If you let them know your pain, it will be almost a neurological response on their part that they will ask for mercy for you. Levakesh rachamim. The idea is that you will not ask for mercy for yourself. You would have thought that would be the simplest approach. You, you should, when you're out there, you should daven for yourself. You should pray for yourself. No. The idea here is to get involved with society, which will get involved with you at a distance, right? Through the power of empathy, right? Empathy with someone who is completely the opposite of you. Here you are living in your cozy inside society, and there is some poor lost soul out there, completely isolated. And if he cries out, of course you are going to respond, levakesh rachanim. You're going to bring God into the equation, and there will be a kind of, a kind of matrix, right? a kind of matrixial condition then. A kind of womb will be created of human beings who ask for mercy. And of course it will happen. In the Book of Lamentations, the, um, the mourner, Yerushalayim, cries at night. And there are a number of um, wonderful midrashim that, that comment on that. Why at night? Why, why, what's the point of crying at night? Because there's an enormous power to the cry that rings out at night, the forlorn abandonment of the cry at night. Right? It has a depth of anguish in it that uh, you know, I, I, I think I have I've actually heard this some time in my life because it feels very, very real to me. And what the Gemara has to say about it, what the rabbis have to say are things like this, that if one, someone cries at night, even the stars and the moon and the planets and, and, and God himself cry with him, cry with him. And one who cries at night, one who is, cries out from that solitary place, Anyone who hears it will cry, will weep, connecto, right? will weep in correspondence to him. That is not with him, right? that's empathy, but it's a little stronger than empathy. It's empathy has about it something thought through. I understand his suffering and I, 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 it brings out in me, but something more on the neurological level, you know, mirror neurons, that people, people are very interested in that now that if you hear someone crying, your neurons, right, your, 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 hormo your hormones awaken to a, exactly the in exactly the same way as the suffering person is experiencing. And that ability, you know, which, ex which explains empathy, is really primal. It's before what we normally call empathy. That the instantaneous effect of the cry at night is that people cry connecto. There's a correspondence there. It fits into that larger reality that I'm calling the matrixial reality, the reality that has to do with a larger container, right? the container, the total container of the world and God, in which one part is 
responsive to, to the other. Um, there's a story told in the Gemara of Rabban Gamliel, it's really a strange story, that a child of his neighbors died and the mother cried for him at night. And Rabbi Gamliel uh, couldn't sleep and he wept with the mother. He wept uh, until his eyelashes fell out. You know, it's almost like a kind of violent uh, response, a counterpart to her crying. And when his students realized that that had happened, they moved the woman to another neighborhood. That is the sense of the invasive nature of the cry. The cry that asks you to ask for compassion. Rabban Gamliel is not proof against it. Right? Somewhere it, it's, it's a, again a liminal movement. It's a movement from the outside in. And he has to cry connecto. That almost hormonal effect of, of the cry that, that issues in an asking for rachamim. An asking for compassion. Compassion. Rachamim. Rachamim is the rechem. Rachamim comes from the, the womb. Right? That I'm calling matrixial condition, in which, uh, in which the baby is held, and everything conspires to hold the baby in 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 peace and in security, in there. And uh, Bracha Ettinger, who is a contemporary psychoanalyst. Uh, talks about that condition, which is a condition in which one can, ha well, one can have with other people, in which one is in a nurturing state at the very sound of the cry of the other person. It's a state in, that is before and beyond words, she says. What is, it when you, what is it to ask someone to respond with prayer to your condition, to your, to your pain? So, what I'd like to look at now is uh, another text in which the um, in which the word levakesh the, the, the expression levakesh rachamim is used. Um, here we should be looking at number nine, but unfortunately um, I made a bit of a uh, mistake, and uh, the Rashi that you have on your page is not the right Rashi. It should be the Rashi on uh, chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 4. So what there Rashi gives us, a, gives us his commentary on these verses in the Torah. I'll read them. Beginning of chapter 2 in, in Genesis, after the creation story is almost over it. Everything has been created. The chal siyach hasadeh terem all the vegetation of the field had not yet appeared on the earth, and all the grass of the field had not yet sprouted. So there is a sense now on the sixth day that the world is still barren. Why has it not yet appeared? So Rashi will say, why is there no vegetation? After all, haven't we read already on the third day that God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation. And we read there that the earth did bring forth vegetation. So in that case, by the sixth day, we're surprised to see that somehow there is no vegetation. What's the reason? How do you reconcile this? How do you account for a, for a real conflict of, of texts? Kilohim tira shem elokim ala aretz. Well, it's very sensible. After all, there can't be vegetation because there hadn't been rain yet. All right. So suddenly you have a chain of causality. What results in vegetation? You have to have rain. Why is there no rain? Because there's no human being. Right, the, the meaning of the text is to till the ground, which would mean there's no human being to till the ground, there's no rain, so there's no vegetation. But Rashi translates this slightly differently. There is no human being. There is no Adam. There's no one who can be called Adam yet. Dam has not yet been created. This is the moment of creation where everything else is in place except Adam, and it turns out vegetation. Um, and the, the, uh, the, 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 the translation that Rashi uses then for lavod is there's no human being to recognize the need for vegetation, tovatam, tzorech, that the world needs vegetation, and to pray to God for it. 
what had happened to the vegetation. God had commanded, let the earth bring forth vegetation. But here you have suddenly again an in-between, a liminal moment. The earth brings forth the vegetation, but only up to the surface of the earth. It doesn't go beyond the surface. Petach Haaretz. As if each one comes just as far as the gateway and stops there and waits for the rain, which will come when the human being prays for it. And then, so when, once the human being was created, right, that, the story of that follows. Mud, God forms, right? human being is created, and the human being immediately realizes what's needed for the world, and therefore he prays to God for it. What you have there is a very, I would call it a teleological story. That is a very pragmatic story, where there isn't something yet. You know, it's, it's potential, but it's not yet there. And what's really lacking is someone who can be called an Adam, again, a human being. And what constitutes a human being is someone who recognizes Ayin, who recognizes what there is not, that something is lacking. And therefore, and so he prays to God, and then what's lacking, you know, then God sends the rain and the, the, and the vegetation uh, comes into the world. And so you've achieved your goal. Vegetation has arrived in the world. That is the, what you get when you have a, a, a functioning, prag pragmatic human being who tries to make things work. The Gemara in Hulin, however, and I wanted to con contrast this, but uh, let's have a look at number 10 that we do have here tells the story slightly differently. And of course, this is the origin. This is Rashi's, Rashi's source. Rav Asi says, quotes the first, the first verse, the verse on the third day of creation, that the earth should bring forth grass, that is, on the third day of creation. And another text, our text here, all the vegetation of the earth ha had not yet come through. This is on the sixth day, Erev Shabbat. It teaches you that the grass had come through, come out, but it stood at the entrance to the earth until there came a human being, the first human being. He was brought into the world, ubikesh alehem rechamim, and he asked for mercy for the earth, for the grass, for, 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 for life in general. Bikesh alehem, he asked for compassion. He asked for that all-enveloping mo modality, which is called Rachamim. And when he had asked for compassion, asked God for compassion, then the rains fell and the vegetation grew. In other words, are we again talking about the success of the mission as being the thing, the vegetation, the vegetation grew? No, because the last word here in the, in the, in the, in the Gemara is, it teaches you that God desires the prayers of the righteous. That is, the culmination of the whole story here is not the grass came through. In the original version, there is a spiritual reality. There's a cosmic reality here, almost like the neurology of the world. Right? The nerves of the world are out of sync. And what the world needs is rachamim. And rachamim is something not specific. It's not a thing. It's a human being who recognizes that what you need when you are in this kind of stalled, stuck place, the place of profound, radical anxiety, what you need is rachamim, right? People, people use that expression, right? Hashem yirachem. It's not a direct ray of something coming from God. It's a container of some kind. It's a sense of living within a womb within the womb of life, and life is functioning. Everything is moving towards vitality and life. If it has stopped, what you need is not the concrete grass. What you need is levakesh rachamim. What you need is to fulfill the divine desire for prayer. It's as if that is the moment of chemical reaction, the moment of need, prayer, and the evocation from God of the fulfillment of his desire, which is the movement of prayer towards God's mercy. Now, mercy in English is, is perhaps less good than, than compassion, right? A feeling of the world working together 
And it's almost grace, a sense, a sense of, of grace. The world working is a theological moment, in other words. What you have when there is not, there is and are not the phenomena of life, of vitality, what one needs at that moment is something that is not a thing. And it's called levakesh rachamim. And in that way, the desire of God can come to be in its fullness. In this way, perhaps, when the Mea Shiloach Yes, let's go, let's go straight to the, to the Svatimet now, uh, the, Mea, the, Mea, uh, the Mea Shiloach. When he, when he talks about the opposite of anger being Tovat Ayin, that if you find you are, you are brooding anger, or somewhere you're simmering with anger, uh, almost unawares, then the thing to do is to cultivate tovat ayin, a benign gaze. That is, in some, way, where, in some way, to enter into that world of rachamim yourself, to evoke it from the world and from God, by, you, simply by the benign gaze, tovat ayin. That was the Mehashiloach. Let's have a look at the Svatim Met. Um, he says something here about the Mitzora, number 11, right? Number 11. Mutsura is motzi ra, someone who extracts evil from his mouth, let's say. And then he makes the statement, which we've made already, but now it's in the, in the language of the Svatimet. He says, in everything there is a com combination, a mixture of good and evil. And so within the human being. But since, well, if a human being is in some contact, in some contact, with the good root, the, the, the benevolent root of life, that is, in some sense, he has something in him. How do they translate it here? In as much as one is connected with the root of things, I think I translated it actually, was it in some way, with all the anger and the sense of being, um, of, of being agitated and on one's own and sterile, if there is some connection, then good prevails over evil. But e evil could easily have prevailed. But there is a tendency for good to prevail. That's, that's a kind of general principle. Midato uh, vamruba. Therefore, one should be careful when one is in that kind of mixed, stuck situation, he says, the mutsora situation, not to extract the evil from the general context. Not to focus only on the evil. Right? Not to get obsessed by, fixated by the evil. Because the evil can only, it's only subject to transformation if it remains within its larger context, mixed with good in some way, and therefore part of a larger reality that is open to transformation and change. So no extraction. Sometimes one thinks if one is ex extracting the bad part, one is abstracting, one is getting a more objective view in some way. Now I really see what's bad. Don't do that. Keep the bad part somehow mixed up with the good and allow the good to prevail but through its sense of connection with something, with, of, with some, of something beyond. What should one abstract from what? What, what should one actually try to find in the mixture of things that one can draw out? And here is Rabbi Nachman now. Um, Likutei Moharan, number 12. He, this is his teaching, Resh um, Pebet, which he regarded as his classic teaching. This is the teaching that he wanted everyone to walk through the world with. Quoting from Psalms, Od ma'at, Vidbonanta, the Ain Russia. Ain Russia. In yet a little bit, you'll find just one little iota in yourself, Odma'at, and you will reflect on it, and suddenly there is no wickedness. Suddenly there's a kind of enchantment, and there is no wickedness. This is the case when a human being thinks about himself. Now, this is in a larger context of advice to a human being to always judge others in a scale of merit, the kafschut, always to think well of other people if possible. It's the opposite of slander. Right? That one should do that, even though it's very difficult to do, because people really are a mass of contradictions, and it's hard sometimes to focus on the good in the other person. 
And then he goes on to say, not only should one do that, one should do something even harder. One should focus on the good in oneself. And that's much harder, he says. Starting from a place of depression, of anxiety, of stuckness, one knows oneself all too well. And one knows that even if one has something good, one did one, a good deed at one point, and I want to focus on that, one knows how many mixed motives there were even in that. If you look closely and clinically, if you look at the, at, 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 at the mixture, then the evil mix is, is there and you can't possibly just tell a, tell, a, tell a benign story. Nevertheless, he keeps on emphasizing that. He says it in many different ways. He has to, he must find in himself some remaining good point. Nukuda tova adayin, some spot of goodness, a healthy spot. Right? Like a healthy spot in a, in a leprous body, right? somewhere that imagery is in the background. Find a healthy spot and focus on that and try to enliven and invigorate that healthy spot. You have to strengthen yourself as, as much as possible so that you don't fall entirely. You don't fall apart. You have to enliven yourself. Rejoice yourself with that tiny bit of good. Odmat, right? That iota that's still there in front of you and that you've in, in you and that you find and you focus on it and you glean that one little dot. And here is the next stage of his therapeutic process. You find one such place, you strengthen it, you enliven it, you connect it then with your deepest feelings, with your deepest, your, your unconscious, I might say. And then you perhaps look around and you find another dot. Maybe you can find another such mere a spot with, almost without dimension. And then it's the, your, the commandment is to keep on looking and gleaning, yelaket, leket, to select out with a pincer the one good thing that there is there in the confused mass. And then, once you've got a few of these black dots, this is the turn, right, the, the astonishing turn of his teaching here. Once you've got a few of these black dots, what you can do is make a nigun out of them. Make out of all these, like, almost like black dots of the notes on the page, you make out of them a melody. You make a sacred melody, a life-forced melody, a melody that brings you fully to life one little dot, another little dot, and suddenly they are connected by what? They're connected by music, sacred music, which is rachamim. It's an expression of that which holds and connects things that seem separate and unconnected. And by a certain kind of use of one's eyes that one can choose, one can choose to emphasize it, to, to, to focus on these dots, one ends up in a situation of Nigun, and one can even become someone who is redemptive for others. That is, one can become a chazan, one can a shaliach tzibor, you can stand there and represent the whole community as it asks for mercy, as it, as it, as it prays. Um, you, you, when, when you are doing that, and the here it's not in this part of, the, part of the text that you have in front of you, but I can't resist bringing it into play, it's so beautiful. He says, then suddenly you also become aware of all those other dots in other people that are yearning towards you because they sense that you can do something to bring them together with, into that melody. That in somewhere all these isolated dots, what does the chazan do? Through his music, he, com he connects the dots and he brings it together in a mode of vitality and life. Um, perhaps I'll finish by talking about, right, very briefly, to say something about Primo Levi, right? Primo Levi. Um, all right, let's have let's have Primo Levi now. Um, on, the, on the last uh, last page of your sources, Primo Levi. Primo Levi uh, was a chemist. And uh, before and after the Holocaust, he worked in, in a lab. And he has one of his most famous books is called The Periodic Table, which is about the various uh, elements, chemical elements. And here he addresses purity and impurity. The so tender and delicate zinc, 
And he's talking now about what happens to zinc. So yielding to acid, right, it's very vulnerable, which gulps it down in a single mouthful, behaves, however, in a very different fashion when it is very pure. If it's pure, pure zinc, right, then, it then, it, then it obstinately resists the attack. And it remains pure and separate and pristine, tender and delicate zinc. It suddenly becomes very invulnerable. One could draw from this two conflicting philosophical conclusions. This is Primo Levi at his most whimsical and most wise. The praise of purity, which protects from evil like a coat of mail. Very strong thing, purity. Keeps you pure and apart from. The praise of impurity, even in small amounts, which gives rise to changes. In other words, to life. What happens, Primo Levi points out, is that zinc sulfate is created. Something, everything starts bubbling. If there is an impurity, if one allows oneself to be accessed by the other thing, right, suddenly, in order for life to be lived, impurities are needed. And the impurities of impurities in the soil, too, as is known, if it is to be fertile. So what we have then is a kind of enchantment, that's the word he uses. There's a strange kind of magic, miracle that happens once there is a bit of impurity. It's a mixture then. And a mixture suddenly can generate life. Suddenly there is vitality. The person who is affected by Tzorat, right, there is, if there is a mixture in him, right, if there is a mixture, that is an enchanted state. That is, that's a state of turbulence, and it's a state of turbulence out of which change can happen. Right? Right? Two he, 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 he even uses the image about his relation with a fellow chemist, uh, one of his co colleagues in the, in, the, uh, in the lab. He says, was a, a woman, a young woman, who he was interested in, who also seemed very isolated. And they could each have kept their fierce isolation from each other. But he started talking to her, and he entered into some kind of uh, a relationship with him, with, with, with her. Um, and then he found that she really wasn't like him at all. She was very different from him. But, and so he's still alone, he says, in the relationship, but alive. Alone, but alive. That is, the isolation can be a toxic, dead affair that comes from dead language, deadened language. Or it can come from an ability to separate out the good from the bad, not the bad from the good, but the good from the bad, and find ways then of reintegrating into different forms what one now has focused on. Now one has material to work with, and one can create larger connections, a whole field, in fact, a whole field of meaning. All right, that field, that desha hasadeh, right, the, the, the grass of the field, the vegetation of the field, the trees of the field, all that stuff is an expression, but I'll finish with this, is an expression of that larger rachamim. Once the rachamim is generated, once life can return to the, to, to the system, what it means then is that a situation of a sterile, toxic situation, purity in a certain way, can be enlivened, can be invigorated so as to create a whole new field of life, a field in which things effect, affect each other. The trees talk to each other, says a, a, one of a Midrash uh, that I'll finish with now, one uh, on, on Genesis. Um, the trees talk to each other. Everyone's engaged in conversation. Maybe you can't hear the conversation, right? but they're all in some way communicating with each other. They're communicating with man. Man is talking about the trees of the field. Right? And the vegetation of the field is always talking about the, the state of fertility in the field and is, is there going to be food to eat and so forth. And these are the connections in which forces are exerted one on the other. And the highest force, the force of prayer, is simply a way of looking at all that communication once it's turned towards life. All that sense of the possibilities of the buzzing world once it's turned towards life and a sense of ultimate direction. Uh, 
I'm sorry for rushing again as usual. Um, let me just um, say that, uh, remind you perhaps that uh, we are having a month's break now uh, because of Pesach and I suppose other necessities um, so that we hopefully will meet again, uh, I think it's the 27th of April, no, on Wednesday the 27th of April, Parshat Kedoshim. Um, so meantime I wish you a very happy and kasher Pesach and uh, look forward to, if not seeing you, then being seen and, and seeing you later uh, in the recording. I want to emphasize again that I do look at the chat, um, so that is a help. Um, and also, if you would like to write to me, again, I'm very happy to receive comments and I will try to address them. If you write to me, I, I will write back. Okay. Shalom and Chag Sameach. <laughs>